Good morning and welcome to a Friday coffee vlog. Hooray. End of the week. Just get the last day of work out of the way. And uh, we'll go away into the weekend, which will be great for doing even more work. I think. Anyway, what's been going on during this week? I've, uh, I've been giving out a try of yet another Windows 10 build. Uh, Windows 10 Professional build 10,041 or 10041, however you'd like to uh, describe it. Um, not exactly been the easiest of jobs trialing this one. Um, the previous build, which was 9681 or whatever it was on, um, I don't know whether it's because it was in a virtual machine or what, but uh, it refused to update the, the build within, uh, within the virtual machine. It, it would download the preview update and say install, it will restart multiple times and all it does is restart and went back to desktop again. Uh, so, gave up on that idea, so I'll just do a, a fresh install, whatever. But apparently there's no ISOs available yet for um, the uh, 10,041 build, the latest one, because uh, Microsoft are now making the downloads in this proprietary .esd electronic software download format. Um, so you download that, so it's a compressed ISO in, in effect, um, only about two gigabytes. Kept downloading that, and then the unpacker, command line unpacker I had to use, kept saying there was a problem with the downloaded files. So download it again, and it kept saying it's a problem, downloaded it on a different computer again, and it's still a problem. So I decided then to get a different unpacker, one of these ESD unpackers. Um, found one of those, and finally that did it, although it took a good hour or so for it to extract everything. Um, I think the theory with these ESDs is that Windows itself would download it and deal with all the unpacking and installing itself. So it's a self-expanding um, sort of file within Windows, but obviously if you're trying to do it externally from the software's environment, then uh, you've got to figure it out yourself, unfortunately. So, finally, managed to do all that faffing about and got it in the ISO and built the, the install in Parallels. Um, got booted up into it. Um, lots of general UI tweaks, trying to catch up where they'd um, you know, not change things from previous generations. Um, that looks quite good. Um, did start to get everything set up and then hit a big wall of a problem that um, most of the apps and the, the store and everything else that needed internet connection kept saying it couldn't connect to the internet even though it could. Um, so I had a, a look about and it seems it when it had uh, first installed and Parallels obviously installs its drivers compatibility to the bridge of the network from Mac, whatever else, and uh, for some reason, I don't know if I missed the notification that um, it gives you to select whether the network you've connected to is private or public, uh, and that makes a big difference because if it puts you on a public network then it restricts access to pretty much everything um, because of security. And uh, yes, it had decided to set me as a public network, so nothing particularly is working. Um, because the firewall blocks everything as well if you're on public, so that was a bit of a pain. And they haven't, I mean this goes all the way back to 7, they haven't made an easy way, or a, an intuitive way, 
of changing that. So what, what's it decided? You've made that initial decision. I don't remember seeing it. I don't know if it just did it itself or what. Um, you can't easily change it back again from there. It's stuck with it. Um, you go to your network settings and you can see that you've got a public network and then network thing and then internet and that's your connection for your adapter but where it says public you really want to just click on that and have a little drop down and set to private to change it that way won't do it and I ended up having to look up different options a load of different ridiculous sort of convoluted methods of click here go to this menu go there open this do this change that and then maybe it might do it or the easier option I chose Get out old registry editor, the favourite of anyone who has to do anything with Windows. I mean, why do you have to poke about in the registry all the time? But you do. So get out your registry editor, uh, heads right the way through to where the relevant key is, uh, and then change a zero to one in that relevant key. And then reboot, and there, you're back. You're in private, not public. But, come on, Microsoft. You know, there must be a way for people. People must, at some point, want to change that initial network decision. Is this a home or a public network? To another way. You know, back to another way. So there should be a way of doing it easily. You shouldn't have to prat about in the registry editor all the time. So, that was a not an entirely great experience of it. Um, I mean, like I say, it's probably with parallels, with parallels installing it, it kind of, because um, I think if the adapter's unknown on the network, it automatically sets it as public. So maybe while the adapter was still being set up, it, the network was there, but it wasn't sure what the adapter was, and it said it's public or something. I don't really know, but it did that. Then uh, set, or with a few bits and pieces added up, and then I've been using Windows Mail, so the built-in mail, which is part of their communications thing now, and there's mail, calendar, and contacts all grouped together. It's communication apps thing. I've been using that on the previous build, um, just to email some PDFs out. There's one company I emailed, Apple Mail, spits out the dummy. Well, it doesn't spit that out, it sends their mail to them, they can't get the PDF out for some reason. I've no idea what email client they use, but if I send them via Apple Mail, they can't get the PDF, so I have to use a different one, and on the previous Windows 10 build, they've been using Windows Mail, which I'd really liked, actually. It's quite nice, nice, lightweight little app, and it looked quite nice as well, so I thought I'd use that again. So I'm going to use it, uh, and it says it it's not installed and can't install. Okay, right, so go to the store to find out why. So go to the store, um, unable to install error code. Try again, cancel, try again, fails again with error code. Cancel, and then reboot, and then try again. Installing it direct from the store. It says, you know, you own this app, install it. Go to install it, um, starts to download, and then comes up with error code. So, well, this is great. So, search the error code, and lo and behold, it's got huge threads of issues with Windows 8 and 8.1. So, it's a bug that's existed since Windows 8, and they first started having the App Store, and they still have fixed it in Windows 10. Now, alright, it's a beta build, but they're supposed to launch Windows 10 in summer, and it's, uh, it's getting sunny. Not long, a few months now. Come on, guys, get coding. So, yeah, a bug from Windows 8 is still existent, and yeah, it just it will not install. I tried all the different fixes, all through going through stopping the Windows services and command shell, and then deleting the software download directories, and then resetting this in command cell, and restarting the Windows update services. Didn't help sign in and out of stuff didn't help nothing helped and in the end oh I'll tell you what I did do as well on the extreme I thought I'll move the app across from the previous Windows 10 to the new one because that'll work right no because uh, all the Windows App Store apps 
aren't just in program files now they're in program files in in a windows apps folder within it which is completely ridiculously locked down so even as an admin account you can't get into it unless you manually change all the settings within it to add yourself in as the admin from what it's the system so as it is an admin account so you're gonna go through all that faffing and you finally get in find your app which is actually in four separate folders with weird bits of stuff that make no resemblance to a previous Windows program ever so you look at all that and think what so delete all those and then move them across from the other one and it, it just doesn't recognize it anyway from because I have to change the registry key but by that stage I've got that bored of it um, I decide that I'll stuff it so I just use Outlook Mail instead um, so just set that up instead because I'd already got Outlook installed with uh, Office 2013 so um, there you are other than that uh, Sage doesn't work still big surprise there not really sure why because every other legacy program even the oldest most archaic program in the world Works fine. I think you know, Leech FTP is probably a Windows 95 program or something I use that works. But Sage, you now it gets so far, it gets set up, and then it comes to sort of come into the main interface and pop, just disappears. Doesn't work. No idea why. So that's a bit of a bummer as well. Well, I say maybe in the next build, but I don't think it will happen in the next build because I think it's just. I don't know there's either something fundamental it relies on is not in there anymore or there's some other issue that I just don't know so that's how I may end up yet just sticking with a very lightweight Windows 7 install well I've already got one next to I'm running anyway so and just run the Sage in that because it works um, so yeah that was my my windows 10 latest build experience it's been fun um other exciting news huge amount more osx and uh, ios betas rolled out this week and um, we're on beta 4 for 8.3 um installed that again and not, apparently there's some changes in emoji but you know, I haven't got ages to hunt about in emoji and look for slightly different variations in the icons to be fair. Um, installed it and it, it's all running fine. Um, Pebble installed an update um, because apparently they had problems on 8.2 as well, people had problems on 8.2. So they updated the watch firmware so now all notifications work as normal again on 8.3 as well. Fixed that. Uh, so I'm back to notification one time whenever the emails started getting collected through. Um, but yeah, I've got to admit, I've been really pleased with the battery life. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's exclusive to 8.3 or something they fixed in it, or it's just been that clean install I did to start on 8.3, but battery life is phenomenal. Some days I'm, you know, taking it off at 7 a.m., going to bed at, half 10 11 at night and we've got 80 percent left still and i'm still plugging it in i've never really liked trusting that it'll last the next day through till the next night as well i don't like to run out of power that'd be a bit of a disaster um but yeah phenomenal battery life i mean fair enough that said that it would be a day when i'm at work and i don't do a great deal on the phone at work because i'm running on a computer most of the time um, some days I'll be taking photos and stopping things, so and bump abuses. But I'll, you know, a lot of the time, all it's doing is dishing up notifications, so it's not getting a, a great deal of use. Maybe at night when I get home, I'll use it more before going to bed. But daytime-wise, it just sits in the pocket and dishes out notifications left, right, and centre. But uh, still, I mean, it, it 80 percent just doing notifications and nothing else is still not bad, really. With it for iOS, I think on the five I'd be on about 20%. Um, 
by that sort of stage, whatever. Because it just seemed to munch through power, whatever it was doing during the day, whether you were using it or not. And then the, the OSX beaters and the Yossam IT latest beater, not noticed a great deal in that, not really bothered hunting out the change log or anything. I've um, just got it all set up. It does all seems to be running a lot smoother now. The Photos app seems to be really getting polished. Um, you're sort of you're opening it on the Mac. Even when I came back from um, from being on holiday, first time I opened it on the in MacBook Pro, the Photos app, the, all the photos from holiday were there already. Uh, you know, I didn't open it and you sat and waited them from download or anything like that. They were just there, visible, uh, which I presume is part of the, this sort of iCloud viewing because it's pulling them from iCloud and they're stored on iCloud, so they're already up there. So you just open it and it pulls them down from there. So that was good. I was impressed with that. Generally, yeah, I mean it's all good. I mean, what's the the public rollout? Um, comes I think it'll be some major improvements for people. Stability is very good. I've been really enjoying operating on all the different apps and they're not really having any problems temperature wise. I'm um, talking about temperature as well the um, the new MacBook Air I got the 2013 model being very pleased with the performance of that and, actually, better news as well, I, I did manage to shift the uh, my 2011 model in the end on eBay. Had a few nibbles. Um, someone was going to come and pay cash, and then the day they were coming, they'd managed to find one for like £350 on Gumtree, so that was the most they were going to pay, and I was wanting £450 if they were paying cash. So I said thanks, but no thanks, so I'll uh, relist it. That was just before I went away, so I kept it. I didn't relist it until I got back, because I didn't guarantee if I put it up there, someone would order it while I wasn't there and couldn't send it. Uh, so, um, put it back up when I got back. I don't think I'm going to have a fight with him. Um, put it back up when I got back, and, and got plenty of views. Uh, put it up at 469. I had it on 599 originally, not 599, 499. And then. Uh, I, uh, I thought I'll drop it a little bit. I had another look round. I still think 499 was a good price for a good condition 2011 with box with all accessories and things. Um, but I think some of the auctions, I mean, there was people up to about £600 for relatively new models on the 2011. But I've seen about 499 for the 256 gigabyte ones or the 8 gigabyte RAM ones. So. That'll drop it 469. And um, anyway, someone did buy it. Decent account with about 130 odd feedback, so not one of these zero accounts. And uh, <coughs> it appeared to be going to a business based premises as well. All confirmed in PayPal and going to the PayPal address. So. And um, I'd had plenty of contact with the buyer. Um, they contacted me about ports and things. He got to 2009 and he was updating that. Um, to get um, Yosemite and the features of that, so um, sent it out. It arrived Monday. I think he only actually got round to doing anything with it last night because he asked me about the password I'd set on it because I'd already set up the OS clean Yosemite with all the updates before I sent it out. Uh, so that all seems to have gone well. So 469, I think. <coughs> I think I won the 2013 at 485, and um, he only had 470 off me when I paid cash because he said of the PayPal and fees and whatever else had saved him, shipping it out. So, um, so I paid 475 for it. So, of course, you've got to remember I had PayPal fees on the transaction for selling mine, and also eBay fees, and also to ship it by carrier to him. In count for probably about 35 quid in all those off what I got for it. So it may be cost me about 50 quid to upgrade to the 2013 version with 8 gigabytes of RAM from 2011 with 4 gigabytes of RAM. 
both were the same size SSD. Not bad, I don't think, really. I said, took the rub with the cosmetic damage. Um, but I'm not too worried, it'll hurt the resale value, but to be honest, I don't see me needing to sell it. I, uh, I didn't really have a problem with the 2011, apart from that USB 3 port. And um, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be any issues with this one for a long time. It's plenty fast, works well. Uh, let's see, it runs really cool. And um, one of the things I thought, uh, we're putting the iCarbon skin on. I did kind of think you, you're insulating it because it's an all metal chassis and you, you kind of expect it to be one giant heat sink. Uh, I thought putting the iCarbon skin on could potentially you know, increase in temps a bit, but generally r running, watching YouTube videos and things, it's only about 48 degrees. And I use um, I stat menus in the menu bars on the Macs to use your processor, temperatures, and um, hard drive space, uh, input and output via Wi-Fi and whatever else and um, so I um, I've been watching the temperatures and just sat watching YouTube videos and whatever else on the side only about 48 degrees idling which is amazing it'd be, it'd be about 75 80 even on the 2011 one um, so that's fine super fast as far as processing and doing all these video conversions and things I've been doing. So um, so yeah, I'm pleased with the upgrade to the 2013. I think it'll last me a long time now. Um, I'm probably ending up passing it down the family, so the fact that it's got those few knocks won't be a, an issue either. And um, yeah, funny enough, one thing I didn't mention last time, the iCarbon skin, amazing feature of it, the, um, the trackpad. You have, you have a skin to go on the trackpad, which doesn't stop it working at all. Which in itself is quite a miracle, but also it's sort of it's ridged because of the the carbon fibre. So it's really quite a, an interesting texture to be using for touch control, as it were. It gives it a nice, um, really nice feel as you're moving about. So um, yeah, I've been quite amazed with that with the iCarbon skin. Right, I'm just sitting out here in the road. I'm going to go get a coffee. So. Uh, Enjoy your Friday and weekend.